Ah. Y bueno, tras, no sé si hacerlo otra vez. No, bueno. Y nada, tras la presentación tendremos, la presentación durará como una hora más o menos, tendremos un turno de 30 minutos de participación del público, tanto de las personas que, que estáis aquí como de las personas que están en casa. Y os agradecemos, eh, si os podéis en vuestro turno, si intervenís, que os presentéis brevemente. Y nada, de verdad que os agradecemos mucho la presencia, nos hace mucha ilusión abrir los ciclos de diálogo improbable un año más. Eh, sé, que muchos alumnos, sé, sé que hay muchos alumnos del máster de esta novena edición, así que os invitamos a venir al, al resto de diálogos durante el curso, que son actividades bastante agradables. Habrá café, perdonad, pero se ha retrasado por el tráfico, pero luego os podéis tomar un café. Y bueno, y aprovecho para anunciar que además de este primero ya hay un segundo diálogo programado que será el 18 de octubre a las tres y media también en esta sala, también retransmitido y ya por título La naturaleza como solución a los problemas eh, rurbanos, que es un juego de palabras entre rurales y urbanos y nos acompañará en este diálogo Julián Briz, que es catedrático emérito de esta universidad. Y Carlos... No tengo nada que decir. No, que, bueno, que Mónica ha presentado porque Mónica eh, en esta nueva edición de los diálogos va a ser la, la coordinadora de la, de la actividad. Es, así que somos todos y todas afortunados, pues sabemos lo, lo comprometida y lo bien que trabaja Mónica. Y como siempre, nos hace mucha ilusión tener en la sala a, a, a alumnos, compañeros del, del máster interuniversitario con la Universidad Complutense, pero también a colegas de, de nuestra universidad y de otras universidades y profesionales que os habéis eh, acercado por aquí. Como sabéis, el, el, los diálogos improbables nos dan el lujo y la oportunidad de reflexionar juntos sobre algunos temas trayendo a invitados eh, tan, tan importantes como nuestra eh, querida Brittany Butler, a que tuve ocasión junto con Julio de, de conocer en su centro en la Universidad de Harvard hace ya unos cuantos años. Uh, it's a pleasure oh, having you here. Thanks for, for coming with your colleague. Uh, I, I don't remember your name. Ali. Ali. Mm -hmm. uh, he's also here. We have had the opportunity to to conversate for for a while during the the lunch, and I think there are many things in common mm. uh, that we're going to share. So the, the presentation is going to be around uh, 45 minutes. Whatever, 30, whatever you um, want. And see, 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 wants also to to provoke a conversation. That's that's mm -hmm. uh, the idea. If someone has uh, uh, problems to to speak in English, we can translate uh, yes. him or her immediately. Yes. Uh, she speaks a little bit okay. uh, Spanish. Yeah. No. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> see, uh, si no, how to say eh, morcilla con patatas, <laughs> <laughs> things like that. It's very important. And, well, eh, muchas gracias a, a todos de nuevo y muchas gracias a Mónica y enhorabuena por esta responsabilidad que sí. te toca. Ah, y el café, el café, si alguien tiene necesidad de un café, se va a la mesa y lo... If you want a coffee, you can go there and bring it. Sí, que una cosa más de agradecimiento, que bueno, agradezco a Andrea Maya que me ha hecho la inmersión en, en los programas de, de diálogo y bueno, y a Karen y el resto de compañeros que ahí están con la producción del evento online y todo, que bueno, también es un trabajo que no se ve tanto, pero sí se ve. Así que... Entonces, le pasamos la palabra a Julio, las alumnas del máster conocen a, a Julio por el nombre, porque en las, mi asignatura le he nombrado unas cuantas veces, él es el líder de la de la misión europea de ciudades en, en España y yo diría que más que hay más allá y, y además de ser un colega excepcional es un grandísimo amigo uh, thank you Julio for bringing people so uh, incredible to this center and for sharing so so many things together so well, gracias Carlos Mónica enhorabuena también y gracias a todo el equipo And now, so we switch to English. Uh, it's like, okay. well, you can understand yeah. Spanish. So maybe the questions can <laughs> also be in Spanish. Yeah, anyway. so if you speak slowly. If you prefer Please. to speak Spanish, we can we can try or Spanglish, right? Yeah, vamos a ver. So it's, I think it's a great pleasure and a great honor to start this session, uh, this season, the, the new series season, right? <laughs> the fifth or sixth or eighth season of the Unlikely Dialogues. Wow with you, Brittany, oh, thank you. and we are also trying here to replicate a bit what you do in at Harvard, right? Mm -hmm. When I was studying there, one of the things I loved the most was this kind of events or sessions where you could have some, I mean, or talk with somebody like you and also promote a dialogue and also know ourselves a bit better and learn a lot between ourselves also. And I think that could be a kind of... Uh, 
pillar also of the master program you are following and also interacting with other faculty, other professors. There are here professors from UPM and also people working at ITD in the different platforms we are working. So I think it's a great opportunity to create in this community. So I'm so happy to start this uh, season with you, Brittany. As Carlos and Monica said, Brittany is the executive director of a center a bit similar to this one at the Kennedy School. You know, the Kennedy School is a school for public policy at Harvard. It, the name of the center is SICI, Social Initiative and Change. I, I, no. Social Innovation. Social Innovation and, and Change, Change Initiative. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And he, she's the executive director mm -hmm. and she's also a faculty, a professor, assistant professor at the Kennedy School. And before joining Harvard, she was also executive director of some social enterprises or social uh, associations, one on mental health yep. and another one on education. Yep. So she brings lots of experience and background also on the social change uh, ecosystem. Yeah. So I think we are here to learn a lot from you and also to share our perspectives and hopefully it would be interesting also for you. And please, she was saying, let them know that I, I like to dialogue even during my presentation so you can interrupt her at any point, but we'll have this 45 or 30 minutes at the end specifically to, to dialogue. So thank you again, thank and you. the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Is this on? You think it's working? Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, gracias, thank you so much to have me here. It's such an honor to be in... Um, in this university doing this incredible work. I just learned more about what Julio and, and the others are doing in terms of pursuing some of our sustainable development goals. I have to say that um, it's probably actually a little strange to see someone from a place like Harvard University talking about social change, because let's be honest, if you think about Harvard University, people know what it is, um, but people usually think of it as an uh, entity that upholds standards and enforces standards, not someplace that changes standards. But I think that we're here now because this is the time to do that. It's the time for the long-standing old institutions and the scrappy little startups all to be rethinking the systems that we are living inside of now. So I have a lot to learn from you by being here. And um, I'll share a little bit about the approach that we've been taking at Harvard, but we take it um, very humbly because uh, institutions like ours have a lot of work to do as well. Um, so I'll start by sharing about the Social Innovation and Change Initiative, which is called SICE for short. Um, our methodology for working with people who are trying to change the world, either by um, you know, uh, use, starting a new organization, innovating inside of an existing organization, working inside of government. For us, the, the vehicle for change, we are agnostic. Um, what we want is the social impact strategy layer of the work to be um, effective. <laughs> and so that's the layer that we work at. And I'll talk a little bit about how we do that. I'll give some examples of the teaching we do. I will give some examples of the research that we are supporting and some of the community building that we're doing. And then I would like for you to ask me questions. I also would be delighted if you interrupt me, as Julio said, even in the next slide. Like it's, I really would love for it to be a dialogue, um, especially because it's a transdisciplinary, multidisciplinary group. I understand that I use words like change. Maybe you use word like transformation. I use words like innovation. Maybe you use a different word. That's not only because of the language difference, that's because we come from entrenched sectors that socialize us into talking about these things in one way. And I think actually that's part of the problem that we come from our sector, we come from our community and we use our words and we don't really trust the people who use other words. So please, if it's a clarifying question or just a, hey, I don't even know if I agree, raise your hand, let's start the conversation as soon as, as, soon as you're ready, okay. Sound good? Great. Uh, is it working? No. Let's see. Okay. So every, I don't know if it's working. Okay, it's working there too. Great. So why focus on change making? Um, I think it's not 
uh, hard for people in this room to believe that we're facing a multidimensional crisis. You know, our democracies are in decline. Our environment is degrading. Uh, we have mass migration happening. Um, our health and our financial systems are not working for everyone. So this is the reality that we're facing right now. And we created the Social Innovation Change Initiative to rethink the systems that are currently producing this state. Let's see. I might need, yeah, I might need people to uh, say next slide. Or, is it not on maybe? Maybe I didn't turn it on. You think it's on? Let's see. Sorry. Okay. okay. So, right. So we want to transform our systems. And we know that this kind of change is difficult, not only technically difficult. Uh, part of the reason we started SICE at the Harvard Kennedy School is because we think about the politics of change. We think about the little p politics of making a human do something different than they're used to doing, right? And we know it's very uncomfortable. It's going to even go against our norms. And what we recognize from research is that you have to, of course, if you're trying to produce social change, be a visionary, have a vision of the world that we want to see, which requires a tremendous amount of creativity, imagination, people from the School of Design and Architecture, they're good at that, right? They understand that. But then also to be savvy enough to navigate the politics of change. How does the vision that you're producing really um, create potentially loss for some people? and more power for others. So this is something that we think a lot about. Oftentimes these pieces exist in the periphery when we talk about innovation. It's sort of a side note, but actually we think it should be brought to the center of the conversation because it, these, um, these norms and these relationships underlie the systems that are um, continuing to stay in place. How's my pace so far? Is everybody good? Yeah, okay. Oh. oh, okay. So our mission is to accelerate the world's capacity for change making. And we do that in two ways. We support the change makers, long time change makers who've been doing the work for a long time, who still need to really rethink their strategy and also very new people who would not normally even think of themselves as an agent of change per se. We're trying to say actually everyone in society has a role to play. Um, you don't need to be the radical uh, protesting in the streets to produce change. And we'll get to that a little bit more later. Um, but we work with all types of people in different positions of authority uh, across different sectors to think about their strategic work. And then we also, because we are Harvard University and we think about our own comparative advantage, we think we can do more to nurture the ecosystem that change makers need to actually thrive, right? Like in the current sort of neoliberal capitalist system that we have globally here, people who are producing social and environmental value do not get rewarded. It's, it's a nice thing on the side, but our system doesn't reward producing social and environmental value. So this is something that we're very interested in as well, thinking about how we work with institutions to rectify that issue, right? If we want, I mean, even academic institutions, we have a hundred years of research on how to maximize financial value coming out of you know, institutions like Harvard Business School. We have nothing <laughs> coming out of universities that's even close to comparable on how to maximize social value. So this is the world that we have. So all the institutions at that sort of grass tops level need to be thinking about the scaffolding. Do you know the word scaffolding? It's like, you know, a building is being built and you have the infrastructure outside so that the workers can make the building. We want to make the scaffolding for this very young space. It's very young. From an academic institution perspective, social innovation is not even a field, it's a phenomena inside of a field. This is the challenge of doing multidisciplinary work is you can't get tenure working on social innovation. You can't get tenure doing social change uh, per se. You have to kind of find your way in. And so then this body of knowledge doesn't exist. And that's a tremendous problem for people who are trying to now change our systems. Got it. So 
How do we do our work? Of course, we are an academic institution. So we do a lot of teaching. <laughs> Um, and we really try to be strategic about the people that we teach. We want to teach everyone, of course, but then we try to think which communities are on the forefront of change, really doing uh, dynamic, interesting, groundbreaking work, and which will communities maybe influence other people to change the way that they do their work. So we think a lot about that. Um, we conduct research, and we try to support uh, the next generation of researchers to build up what it is that they're trying to do and be able to get tenure um, even while focusing on social innovation and social change. And then the third pillar is really around field building or community building. And I was sharing with you know Julio or over lunch, it's not really just sort of creating an empty um, vessel that we bring people in. We really think about what the interactions between all the stakeholders in the ecosystem need to look like and how can we, from our position, curate the relationships that will break with some of these norms, some of these standards. So we bring the funders together with the young people doing the work and we try to um, forge new relationships around values and around frameworks that we think will help move their work forward. So we are curating an experience that we think will um, enable change to happen more quickly. So just quickly a deep dive into one of the organizing frameworks that we use. It's very simple, but actually very hard to do. So let's say you are trying to produce a change and you care about homelessness, okay? So you wanna work on homelessness. So I would come and I would first start with the problem. Okay, oh, I don't have a pointer, but we always, oh, there we go. Oftentimes I find in centers focused on innovation, we there's a risk that people start with the solution and the innovation before they actually deeply understand the problem. So for us, it's very important to say, to scope the problem carefully, um, to think about why that problem exists, what its root causes are, why has it been persisting for so long? The next thing we think about is the person. Um, and it's not, it could be a person or a group of people, but it's the person or the group of people that are the authors of the problem statement, right? The people who share a definition of a problem as it is situated. And we ask them to look at their personal sources of power. Why are you even the right person to work on homelessness? Do you know anyone who's homeless? Have you been living in a place that has homelessness or are you so far outside that you don't actually have legitimacy to be working in that space? It's not to say that you can't build legitimacy, but we ask people to really look deep into the resources and the networks that are available to them right now and say, what's my positioning? What is my positioning? Um, and is how does that relate to the problem at hand? And maybe what's even the bias that I bring in based on the way that I was raised? Um, how maybe have I even myself been perpetuating the problem, okay? So we really ask people to look deeply in that. And then the pathway to scale, of course, is the solution, the, um, and it's never static, it's always dynamic, but this theory of change for how you're going to produce social good, social value. Um, and we have people look at, you know, okay, so you're producing social value for a group of people, does that actually change the system or does that just produce social value for a small group of people? Like having people be able to move up and down levels of abstraction from this work is helping you today to this work is going to change the system eventually is a lot of mental work. And we ask them to think that through. And finally, the idea for a social innovator is really to thread the needle through these things and find the middle. Um, and it's always, of course, surrounded by an ecosystem that is constantly in flux. So um, this is a very helpful organizing framework for the way that we teach people, the way that we help them build out their strategy. So I want to offer that. I'm gonna pause for a second. Does anyone have a question about that? It's okay if you don't, but I can wait. Yes, please. Yeah. Hold on one second. Let me give you a mic, actually. Yeah. I'm already messing everything up by asking. Thank you. We're already breaking the norms. So here we go. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Diana. Diana. <laughs> Just Mucho, gusto. Mucho gusto. I would like to know how the people who is interested in kind of projects is getting involved in it. 
how maybe people... I have an idea of having a new business, opening a new business. Yeah. How can I get in touch with you? Oh, great. Well, I can give my information to anyone here. Um, we don't, frankly, we're not at scale yet to, um, uh, to help literally every single person. So the, what we would do is try to share and be open with the frameworks that we use right now in terms of our educational programming, just to be more concrete. We have work that's just for Harvard students. We have work in executive education, and now we're moving into online education. But we, at the moment, don't have, um, we only have six people, seven people on staff. We're seven years old too. Um, and so we're trying to figure out, you know, how to um, support people at scale. The, that's part of the reason that we're very strategic about who we teach, because we try to find organizations like this one where we share and then they can support you through their network. So you personally, because we're meeting now, of course, you can contact me and we'd be delighted to help. But the the, the vehicle to kind of scale our impact through education is something that I'd love to hear more if you have ideas about how we do this, right? Because my concern about centering us as the um, carriers of all the knowledge is that it, we're never gonna be able to work with every Diana all over the world. Like, how can we, how can we do that? So. I would love to think about how we make it, we democratize access to the content that is normally kind of hidden inside of the academy. So. I have a question. Yes, please, yeah. My name is Giuliani. Giuliani, I think. I don't know. If it's yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I understand this ec ecosystem yes. more focus on the problem, but as I understood the pathway to scale would be related with the solution, right? Yeah, That's... I mean, there's a there's we don't promote innovation to be cool or innovation to make money. I mean, it's innovation to solve a pressing social issue. But at the sure. same time, needs to be sustainable yep. and change the the change the way things are done related with the third sector, with the yes. the international cooperation, yes. the the public money, how circulate. My question goes more related with uh, uh, how you in, um call to attention for companies to understand that there, there is a new way to make business and, and, and the business is related to how the money circulates and that relates with policies. Yeah. But how how you can how which part of the project you are you are raising? Are you approaching CEOs? Are you approaching social responsibility departments? to look, open your wallet for a new way to, to donate, which is not a donation anymore. Right. Because we feel as the business sector, we are very difficult to explain this and to find different ways to finance what we are trying to do. It's a great question. And it's, it, this is not, I mean, this is not well understood. This is like the topic of the day. And even if you find more and more impact investing is becoming popular. And you hear people say, you know, a fourth of the investable money is just sitting in the sidelines earmarked for sustainability, but the money's not flowing, right? So to us, it's not a matter of, I mean, often you'll hear business saying, we would like to, but it's so hard to measure. But we had a social, um, we have a visiting social innovator program where we have people come, practitioners from outside and come and work at our center. We had Gene Rogers, who created the Sustainable Accounting Standards Board. So it's like, you know, the financial accounting, like FASB, but SASB. And it's to create standards for every single industry, looking at the social and environmental impact across, you know, 80 different industries. Okay. She did that 15 years ago. The standards and the measures are there. The money is still not flowing. So to us, this is why we talk about the politics of change, because to us, it's a matter of what we value. It's a matter of political will. It's a matter of, do you care about the environment and animals and social justice or do you not? So one thing is just, let's be real, that you know corporations are not gonna change unless they're regulated by the government. Governments are not gonna regulate until the people demand it. Like that's the end of the story. And so it's so interesting. We are here actually in Spain because we were um, we received award, an award, but it was given at the Guggenheim in Bilbao. And one of the reasons we thought it was so interesting to be there is because I think culture and, and arts actually have a huge role to potentially play in pushing for this kind of conversation. Yes, because 
Socialist yes, so we're going to get into this a little later. My colleague, Julie Badalana, uh, from the business school, but also from the Kennedy School, she's jointly tenured at both. She's done a ton of work looking at hybrid organizations, organizations that pursue social and commercial goals. And what we're really talking about here is shifting power inside of those organizations. And, you know, we can talk more, but power is access to resources that other people value. So sometimes it's money, you're right. How do we get them to open their wallet? But there are other kind of resources that people also want and need, even including self-esteem, psychological purpose, right? These other things that we value. And so what can the arts and what can culture do? It can, you can either get more resources or you can change what we value. You can change what society values, right? So I think art and culture is a tremendously underutilized resource to shift public demand for corporations and governments to get in line with what we actually value, what we want our lives to look like. You know, it's not an easy thing to say, but really, I think at the end of the day, the work is actually about relationship and um, our values and mobilizing people to care because we can do it. Yeah. So I don't know if that's something. then I also just to give you another argument, like I would point to. I mean, for, unfortunately, we are at a, such a crisis now, such a multidimensional crisis that the corporations don't have workers. Unilever makes soap. What if we run out of water? You know, at this point, our resources are becoming so scarce and under such duress that I think, I do think corporations are starting to recognize that there is no actual business case to be made in some of these sectors. And so they are now turning and it's just slowly turning. Uh, to say, hmm, maybe we should do something different. I don't know. That's not everything, but yeah, yeah. Thank you. And I think there is a couple of questions from the online. Uh, online, yes. That'd be great. Yeah. Do you want to read them? Ah, sorry, sorry. There is one from where? Ah, okay. So I think Amanda was asking. I saw. I don't know if she's asking anymore. No. Ah, yes, Amanda. We can't hear you yet. But I could see it in the chat. Oh, you didn't. Amanda, you are muted. Maybe turn up the volume on the laptop. This is very. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hi, Amanda. Hi. Hi. Sorry. Hi. Um, Brittany, thank you so much. Um, um, I have a question, maybe it's, but anyway, uh, I will I will take the the chance to to ask the question. It's a little bit related with this specific um, uh, slide you were on. Uh, well, my name is Amanda. I'm I'm part of the ITD team. I work specifically in the line of art um, of the ITD, and I wanted to ask you about a, a more uh, let's say communitarian notion of, of social innovation, which for what I've seen, I think uh, is also part of the. the S S I C I uh, rational, no? The I is so something far. individuals, but it's rather uh, you you were talking about that right now, no? And um, so, how do you articulate such approach uh, through this three uh, P framework that you were presenting? Amanda, I missed the core part. I heard like the oh, beginning no. and the end, <laughs> oh, no. but I know that you're from the the center here. I know that you right. want to know how we apply the SICE framework to something, but what is that something? Can you say it again? Right, right. The something was that um, uh, a more communitarian notion of this, of so social innovation, uh, because, uh, hello? Again. Okay, I I'll write it. I'll write it down. Maybe. Why don't you type it? Yeah, I think I think yes, maybe yes. for online we should try typing. Oh. Um, okay. Thank you. I, I want to hear typing. Question. Maybe while you're typing. Well, let's see. There is another one. Yeah. Could you say what you mean by the term scaling? Yeah, it's a good it's a good question. So. Uh, scaling impact. So not necessarily scaling the size of the organization, but scaling the social or environmental impact. Um, and, you know, honestly, there are very few social problems that are going to be solved. 
So I think, you know, it's up to the change making community to decide in any given context how you scope the problem. But in theory, it's fully scaled when the problem is solved, right? But it, or when the solution or what you're pushing out at least like reaches all the stakeholders possible. That's essentially how we've been defining it. I think there are a ton of misconceptions about, you know, needing to scale means you grow your organization larger. We do a lot of strategic thinking with change makers about different kinds of models beyond just growing your organization's size, you know, ranging from open sourcing your ideas to creating coalitions to uh, replicating across different uh, regions. So I think that the vehicle to scale is it has a wide variety. And I don't necessarily think that um, any one of these things will really be solved, but addressed at the level that you've scoped the problem is maybe the easiest way to say that. I want to ask more about communitarian notion of social innovation, which I think is also part of the site's rationale. The idea that social change is making not something dependent on specific individuals, but rather on a sum of individuals so how do you articulate such an approach? I know, I mean, per, maybe what you're getting at is that it's like, it's not about a particular person, but it could be through collective action. So this is what I was trying. I think we could do better at this, clarifying that what we mean is like a defined set of actors who agree on the problem statement. They may not even actually agree on the path forward, but the certainly the problem statement is important because it has implications for different stakeholder interests. And so to us, there is some alignment, but it could be a series of actors and it doesn't matter if they're inside a single organization or part of a collective or a collaborative that I think still many of the principles remain the same. Thank you. Why don't I keep going and then we'll see. Oh, I didn't understand that one. Um, so we'll, this is just an example of a student who works in one of the, the accelerator that we run on Harvard campus, just to make it tangible. Although for this group, I don't know that we need to, but Vikas uh, was a student in our accelerator. He came to Harvard Kennedy School to get his master's. He's from a small older farmer family in India. And maybe many, maybe people here in the community know that if you're a small holder farmer in India, the suicide rate is like one every hour. I mean, it's just surreal um, because it's essentially untenable. Um, they get no, very little wages. They are subject to you know, the whims of the climate and your life can be over in a matter of just one, you know, one season's bad weather. Um, and so Vikas's grandfather uh, said to him, like, don't become a farmer, like, or I'm gonna see you hanging from this tree. Like, don't do it. And yet he entered into agriculture um, and started to learn about the industry because he felt that this is absurd. Like one should be able to make a living as a farmer in India as we have done for generations. And he was very aware of the exploitation that so many of the people in his community were facing. A lot of predatory lending, um, a lot of middlemen taking advantage of a system that was really squeezing the guys at the bottom. Um, and so he became really interested in, at first he, when this is a giving an example of like problem scoping that we do. So at first he said, I just, I want to increase their income. Like they need money. <laughs> they need money. I, it's all about income. Uh, I think very quickly he came to recognize that what he actually cared about was their agency, like their ability to make choices about buying and selling when they want to, rather than being subjected to the whims of all these other actors in the system. And as he focused more on agency and less on income, income came, but the agency enabled him to see opportunities to um, find gaps in the system where these smallholder farmers finally could have uh, more control. And so he played, he innovated in many different ways. He thought about um, grain storage. He created a, a warehouse that would store the grain so they could wait until the price was better instead of having to sell as soon as it came off uh, the ground. That was okay, but not great. He ultimately came down to 
some post-harvest services, including essentially just handling some of the asymmetries of information that were happening in the system, like using very simple technology, like a simple cell phone to keep them up to date on the crop pricing information. But also he enabled a bunch of young people to go around with little backpacks and check the quality of the grain uh, in the communities that he was trying to serve because these farmers had no idea whether they had A, B, C, D grade quality grain. So they had no, they didn't have the information they needed to negotiate and have agency. They had to rely on somebody else. So as he thought more about, well, who has the agency in the system, he realized actually it was around grain quality and pricing. And so not an expensive innovation at all, but just through this mobilization of young people going around and teaching the farmers how to do this, now he's got 180,000 smallholder farmers. That was as of last year. I don't, I don't even know. Uh, all using this digital platform to essentially circumvent the middlemen. Um, and so this was, took many, many iterations to think about, um, you know, the right solution for this specific context. But we work hand in hand with the students coming up with solutions like this. So that's our teaching. We have again, you know, teaching that we do. Uh, with the students at Harvard, but we have teaching that we do with practitioners out in the field. Um, this is just a small group of the faculty um, that are comprised of our kind of research community. Many of them are not from Harvard. You know, we, we are, it's very clear to me that Harvard should not be the center of research in this field, because again, I don't think anyone can um, dominate the space around this knowledge. Like it needs to be multi-university uh, conversations. And so we were honored to have people from the local um, ecosystem, from MIT, from Tufts, but also, you know, increasingly people, Joanna Mayer from Perti School of Business, you know, across the world. And the question is really, what does it take to tackle the multidimensional crisis at hand, you know? So I'll give an example of my colleague, who's also the founder of SICE. She's our faculty chair, Julie Batalana, HBS and HKS. These are two books that she's recently written. So I'll just take a look. I mean, I said a little bit about power. Her other book is about democratizing work. So that's a little bit more of a prescription for how you can potentially shift power. And she looks at giving more power to stakeholders and corporations, um, giving them a say in what it is that they want to do. But on the power front, what she's essentially saying is that these multidimensional crises we face are the result of a concentration of power. So for many, many years now, we've had <laughs> large institutions sort of operate the status quo. If you look at, um, you know, CEO pay is just one example in the United States. I mean, the gap is 300 and something times more than a worker, right? So, and I think in Spain, it's really interesting to be here because you have places like Mondragon, like, you know, that are really looking at worker cooperatives and limiting the gap between what the CEO gets and what the worker gets uh, so that, you know, we rectify some of these things. But those are very rare models uh, that aren't really prevalent. And so you, you can see the research basically pointing to this concentration of power directly driving environmental destruction, rise in economic inequality and threats to democracy. And so for us, it's important to demystify what power is and have people understand that it isn't only about financial, financial uh, resources flowing, that there are other sources of power that power is not actually inherently dirty. I think we all, especially those of us who really care about the world, we like, we want power, but we don't really want power because only yucky people have power. And so how do we like change our own mindsets about how we build power and how we use power to make a world that we wanna live in? So this is um, an example of the kind of research coming out of our uh, initiative that I think is really helpful in a pragmatic way, like, yes, it's very interesting for theory, but it's very helpful for practitioners, I think, as well, to overcome some of the challenges that they're facing as they try to make change and they come up against the system. Um, well, I'm going to pause for a second, actually. Any questions on power or anything that I said about research or how we do, how we're building out our, the research at CICE? Yeah. Um, I've talked about power. Oh, sorry. Hi, I'm, I'm Carla. Uh, I'm a student at the at the master. Carlos is actually one of my professors. Oh, cool. <laughs> but yeah, so how do you deal with lobbying in the United States? Because that's like a very big part of policymaking in the United States. And now that you're talking about power and like how to share power and you don't want power, 
I feel like that's a takes a huge toll on people that are working on change making since policy in the U.S. is influenced by lobbyists. Yeah, indeed. Uh, how do you deal with it? Uh, I mean, there are many different actors sort of tackling lobbying in a number of different ways from the sort of regulatory framework of hopefully limiting their ability uh, to influence certain sectors to more informal approaches again, um, or lobbying groups that are pro-social, you know, trying to mobilize more capital to compete with some of these large lobbies. But um, I don't actually know, it's not my area of specialty, but it's something that certainly is very important. I mean, we have faculty at Harvard who teach whole courses just on lobbying. And I think what you're pointing to is one concentration of power that is really important to sort of understand and either work around or work through. I mean, do you do work just like what makes you curious about it? Like, are you actually in that space right now? Are you thinking about it? Or? Um, no, I'm, I'm just very interested in U.S. politics. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's forgetting. Okay. Um, I'm just very interested in U.S. politics. And that's something that I've actually debated a lot with friends that are like also studying political science. So I feel like from this point of view, it's interesting to think like now that you are teaching how to make change, like how can you get through those systems? Like for me, I'm from Mexico and we have corruption, for example. So yes, we do it's too, not as actually. bad as it's <laughs> like you have lobbying, we have corruption. So we my corruption. family, yeah, <laughs> I don't think I don't think it's as bad. But <laughs> but yeah, so it's like, how can you go around the systems or like, how do you teach people to go around these systems that are like, yeah, kind of the biggest blockers? I think the big theme for us is that it is that these things, these there is it's not like a monolith, right? It's like every it's nuanced in every situation is what to what I'm trying to say like depending on what social con what social issue you're trying to drive forward you're going to have a very different approach change making approach with respect to lobbying so that's what I'm trying to say is like there is no uh, uniform approach because and this is what I was saying with Julio too I think it's so clever that they've got this that the the region has these missions right because teaching this stuff in a vacuum when you're not thinking about like which social issue you're trying to unpack is kind of useless. I mean, yes, of course there's frameworks and there's principles, but I think the reason that we don't see more like cookie cutter prescriptions for something like how do you deal with lobbying is because sometimes lobbying can be very helpful to you in certain sort of social change situations. And sometimes it's the biggest detriment. So I don't know if that's helpful, but yeah, I would say break it down. Okay. Oh yeah. Do you integrate the problems in a specific course or in a group of courses? Do different professors work together? And then maybe can you move the second one is being answered. Thanks. Problems into a specific course. So there are faculty at Harvard Kennedy School. There are faculty across Harvard that do courses that specifically focus on a problem, right? So we have same as I think you guys, you know, at the design school, you might, and then sometimes we do it based on geography. So I'd say sometimes there are courses based on, okay, how do we tackle climate change? And there's also a lot of co-curricular stuff happening now at the university around climate change, but honestly, far too late. You guys are way ahead of us. Um, it's sort of sad. Um, but, but then there are people who also say like, okay, let's take the city of Madrid. Like what, how can we re-envision the city of Madrid by 2040? So there's courses on different ones. Sometimes they involve deep dives into policy. Sometimes they involve literal field trips and deep dives. We really focus on, um, again, the social impact strategy layer agnostic of the particular social issue because we find uh, we're very interested in like the people who are on the frontier of whatever it is that they're working on and the challenges that they are facing that just happens to be kind of where we are. And so we can't have the capabilities to teach someone a deep dive in homelessness and a deep dive in health and a deep dive in the environment. It's too much specialization. That's very important, but not something that like we as a center could ever do. And so we, that's actually why we end up working most with people who already really understand the problem and they're already experts in the space. We're not, we, we talk about social innovation on a continuum in terms of education. And there are the people who are just like curious about innovation. We don't really work with them very much, to be honest, because we're trying to be further along into, okay, you know exactly what you're trying to do. You know exactly who you are. You're gonna do this for the next 15 years. 
okay, now what do we do? Like, let's be hand in hand with you on that strategy because just figuring out what you care about, trying to understand a problem, that's a very important work, but it, it's already like th five classes, you know? So, so that's, that's how we differentiate ourselves within the university. And we have the privilege of doing that. The other way I would say that we're differentiated in the university is that we have a whole um, organization dedicated to startups and to entrepreneurship and to innovation in the basic sense. And so we don't have to teach people how to lead a team. We don't have to teach people so much about creating a financial model. Like, yes, we can talk about these things, but we get the privilege in some ways of thinking only about the social impact strategy layer of the work, which oftentimes gets ignored because people are trying to survive. And so we teach things like, what are the unintended consequences of your social innovation? Like how often do we get to think, most people in society, if we're going to be lucky if they even care about social impact. Then you take those people and you say, oh, you could have a lot of, we all know about social innovation that's actually produced harm, but we don't actually talk about it that much. We don't ask ourselves, how can we avoid those harms? How can we take more responsibility for the negative externalities of our well-intentioned work? And so those are the kind of things that we end up talking with our students about, which I realize is a privilege, but very important work to do. Um, I don't have a sense of the time at all. So just flag me if I have to stop talking. 30, 30 minutes. minutes. Okay. So the last pillar is community. I think this is not so hard to understand. And I've already said a lot about it, but just this is our, the community that we're building here. So we have right now officially 20 faculty that have said, Hey, we want to be affiliated, but we're still frankly defining what affiliation even means. Like we would love to broaden that. And I'm doing some fundraising to try and enable a bigger community that we can actually support intentionally. Um, we have our accelerator, we have executive education graduates, we have uh, an online course on power actually, where we're providing scholarships. Anybody who would be interested in that, please let my colleague Ali know. Um, we partnered with Harvard Business School to use their incredible platform to create this very dynamic 40 hour course online about power. You can get a certification from Harvard Business School. Normally they charge $1,700. We make it $50 if you can write to us and say what social change you're trying to produce. So if anyone here is interested, let us know. That's our first kind of foray into opening up some of our content in a deep way and creating a community online. This is just to say what I said at the beginning. These are some people who graduated and but it's really that those who are doing work may see themselves outside of a place like Harvard. And I, I just wanna say again, like this is something that we have to change. And I would say for any of us in privileged institutions, including academia, like this is something we have to change fast. It can't be that social change happens only by the radicals or the saints in the room. Like everybody has a role to play. And maybe I'll end with that, which is just, again, one of the frameworks we really like to use is that social movements, need three types of things, right? It's not just the people in the street, although they need to be there. Let's not, let's be honest. Fighting the status quo, raising awareness, saying this is not right. We also need innovators, the ones who actually have the idea for the future we wanna live in. And Ali and I, you know, we go through a lot of applications to see who should be in our accelerator. And a lot of times the question that people have a lot of trouble with when we say is what will the world look like when your problem is solved? So let's say they say they care about racism and maybe they really care about racism. But when we say, what will the world look like without racism? They just say back to us, it will look like there's no racism, but what does that look like? What does that look like? Like what's the painting if you're painting a picture because until you have a picture of it, we can't, it's very hard to run towards it and make it happen, you know? So we really need those of you in the room who are doing the creative fields, like the architects and the designers, because I think you guys understand how to envision a new world, right? But so many people, they know what they don't like, but they don't know what they want. And so there's the creativity involved in picturing what we want. And then there's the orchestrators, which maybe some people think is very boring, but extremely important work, which is your connecting all the actors together who have to be in communication. This is what Julio is, the, he's the orchestrator extraordinaire. 
you know, all of the people who have to be moving together to change a system. And a lot of times we find that the agitators look at the orchestrators and they say, oh, you're just selling out, like you're not really doing anything. And the orchestrators look at the agitators and they say, why, this is not the way to make change. We can't keep doing this, but social movements need all three. And so I think my hope and my ask of you is that, you know, you find which one is works for you right now. How do you see yourself in a movement for a change? Maybe you could be more than one. You don't have to stay. You can start as an agitator and then realize you need to be an orchestrator. I mean, there are so many different cases and examples of how people shift, but that's what we hope from everybody here. And so that's where I will leave us today. Okay, thank you. And this is like for signing up for our newsletter if you want, so. Yeah, right. You can use the QR code. So any other questions, comments, critiques are also welcome. You want to sit down? Yeah, or let's sit down or I... discuss. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> so now even more informal and dialogic conversation. So please share your thoughts. It shouldn't be any question if you don't want. So maybe thought, any suggestion, any comment. And we are here all to learn. So yes, you don't have please. To be smart and very no, you do. clever to talk, but you are sharing your thoughts in your perspective. Hey, hello, I'm Paula. I'm a student from the master. Hi, and I would like to know how an innovator can make sure that the impact of their action, social action, is a real making a change on a problem and not other any cause. Like, is there any uh good short-term indi in indicator that proves that uh, this uh, social innovation is actually improving the situation and not any other right. thing not being considered? I, it's a great question. And again, like no one ever asks that question because they're like, how do I do fundraising? And it's like, okay, you like, you know, I so appreciate your question. Um, there's always a cost. There's always going to be a cost. Someone might be, might lose or their lives will change. I mean, there's always a cost. And so I think it's about the cost that's worth it. You know, it's more about the relative, this is my opinion. Anytime you change something, there's gonna be someone who's affected maybe in a way that they weren't expecting. And so it's the cost benefit analysis is what I would say, like looking at that ratio and really understanding who your stakeholders are, um, understand. And, and I would say in terms of measures, I think you can probably guess. I mean, if you do some of the exercises like a pre-mortem where you say, we do this a lot, even on our own team. Every year we say, this is what we want to do. Let's now imagine that we dramatically fail. Like we screw up big time. Like what's your best guess of what that failure is? Because there's some um, really good evidence that these, what they call a pre-mortem instead of a post before death, instead of after death, are very effective at surfacing the likely problems that you are going to produce with your work, right? Like, it's not actually, I mean, sometimes we're really shocked, but, and we had no idea that we would hurt this community or not. But 80% of the time, we can surface a lot of the potential challenges. So I think just as the same as we track with our theory of change, the outcomes that we want, we actually can also create measures for the likely costs and track them. I mean, just like we track uh, social indicators for progress. I don't know if that helps, but yeah, thank you. yeah. Hi, thank you for, for the presentation. Um, it thank was actually interesting what you talked about the crisis of uh, power concentration. And I was wondering if you could speak more about agency. You mentioned agency and power. Uh, just if you could talk more about that, because I think some of the discussions we often have at, at ITD when we talk about environmental policies is also what does a just transition really mean yep. in certain contexts and it yeah. changes depending on sectors etc and so it's one of the questions I think a lot about agency when I don't know uh, for example the movements of extreme rights since you brought the demo democracy in decline it's also well this environmental policy uh, will tell me that I can't have a car and I can finally buy my car. I don't know. Those, those, that, that narrative or that sense of agency that an environmental policy that is aiming and a trail that is aiming at uh, improving uh, CO2 emissions might bring this loss. sensation, this resistance, a loss. Yes, yeah. thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I was wondering if you talk more about agency and thinking about this context. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, again, a combination of... Um, inclusive processes, which of course, you know, 
so much about and how you enable, how you build a coalition of people around whatever change you're seeing so that it's not imposed, but they feel like they are the authors of the problem statement. I think that promotes agency because you're really, you're promoting power sharing by enabling them to set the agenda, you know, and, but we can't always do that. But I think there's a bunch of research looking at um, power sharing partnerships and inclusive ways of building agendas so that everyone feels they have a role in, um, in the transitions that we're having instead of the transition happening to you. So I think that body of work research is very interesting. Um, I think also pointing to and creating that creates conduits for them to actually have power, you know what I mean? And to have a voice is important. Um, I think there's also just agency over whom, you know, so power is not <laughs> something that uh, you have over everyone the same. Like I might have power over Julio. Uh, I don't have power over Ali, but Ali has power over Julio because Ali has something that Julio values and Julio has something I value, you know, so it's relative between each person. So part of it is also creating uh, different avenues of agency using the resources available that aren't necessarily so obvious, you know, even to that stakeholder at the time. I don't know if that's too abstract, but um, I think sometimes it's uh, a creative act to look at um, where you get power from. And again, I think a lot of your work around building kind of coalitions outside of the typical silos that we operate in, like bringing in other stakeholders is part of what can like bring power to someone who's traditionally disenfranchised in that like local community. So I don't know, those are my thoughts. You have thoughts about that? I'm curious. No. Well, yes. Okay. 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 Yes. I want to hear what your thoughts are on that too. Though. It's a good question. Yes, I love it, and I would love to know more about your your thoughts and your perspective about values, right? Because when you bring all these people together, they have very different values and loyalties and interests. So you yeah. were we were talking over the lunch about how to also shift or transform a bit the values through narratives. Yes. So your thoughts and, and if you have any idea on how to, you know, build a common or joint value or value proposition with many different values that can bring people together and work together to solve any challenge. Right. I mean, I think first it's so, there's so much noise, especially in the social innovation space, people talking about how they want to do social innovation and it's just window dressing. I mean, it's just, it's not real. It's superficial. It's like, posturing you know for their brand and so it's hard I, I'm finding it hard too to figure out the process where you sort through and look for people who truly are values aligned so I think just even identifying what people's values are is difficult in this moment because everyone knows that they should care about the environment but how much do they care about the environment you know everyone knows we should care about people who have no homes but do you really care or not you know this is hard to figure out and so just the filtration process itself, I think is difficult. And I actually don't know if the values are too misaligned, how easy it is to build a coalition. I mean, I think I, I think that the, at the level of values, it's so fundamental and so basic that you can find two political parties that share a similar value set. But when But if you're telling me a scenario where we really don't share the same values, that's quite difficult. But I'd say what you're talking about with your mission, you know, your missions, I think that's probably the best next next chance is that we're all running towards a future. If we can agree on the future, we can have many different narratives about why we should have that future and how we're gonna get there and many different theories of change. But if we all agree we need to be carbon neutral by 2030, then at least we have like something that we're running towards and then the values are important, but potentially less so. Um, the question of like how you convert people's values I mean, you can go to the church. It's very interesting. <laughs> hey, they're very good at it, right? I think it's interesting. I think at the academy has, you know, and for lots of important reasons, has lost um, its connection with, you know, what the, what 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 uh, the church or different religious institutions have done. But it's this transformative act, right? It's this. There's other things that we can do in education or in the U.S. There's a saying like, if you you go into the army one way and you come out a different way, right? Like we know that there are transformative experiences that actually shape people's values. And I think it's very important to look 
and actually unpack those institutions and figure out what, how they do that, right? Like how they do that value transformation work. Cause that's deep work that does not happen overnight, um, but very important. Yes. Was that someone screaming into the abyss about our presentation or outside? Okay, I was making sure it wasn't about our presentation. Wow. <laughs> So I read it, okay, question. with regard to the role of art and culture, and specifically on the task of creating value around social change making, it often seems to me that the role of art and culture are not easily understood. Totally. We need a high degree of advocacy, and still the legitimacy of such lines of work often comes if there is a financial value attribution. Yes. In other words, it seems that their value depends on a kind of financial value the equ equivalency, even though there are many other intangible benefits associated. Totally. How do you navigate that through your advocacy work? Wow. <laughs> right. I mean, I think I've learned a lot um, in the U.S. I, 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 mean, I, have, I have to say, like, Hollywood has been a very interesting vehicle in the U.S. looking at the power of the arts to change public opinion. And sometimes it's true there has to be, you know, um, you know, a blockbuster movie in order to get the kind of visibility. But you can every once in a while you see like an independent film. So, for example, the independent film Roma, which was about a person who came to um, be um, a domestic worker and the life of what it is to be an invisible domestic worker. It had tremendous impact in the United States. It won an Oscar. This is an independent film um, that really was relatively low budget. And we um, have visiting social innovators, as I mentioned before. So I mentioned Gene Rogers, who created SASB. Now we have another visiting social innovator a couple years ago named Palak Shah. She's in charge of the National Domestic Workers Alliance. So all of her work is about creating rights for domestic workers, creating visibility for domestic workers, creating... Um, she she has a um, she has a policy arm that they do so they do lobbying uh, in the government to create rights for domestic workers. She has um, a domestic worker bill of rights that they're trying to pass right now. But then they also have this partnership with Hollywood. And what's interesting is there was this movie called The Help, which was about again domestic workers. But earlier than that, um, that was again like very well received. And then Roma. Now they had the partnership. Was it a plan like, okay, we're going to make Roma and then everything's going to change? No, she talks a lot when you're making a social movement about you have to have the infrastructure ready so that when the perfect moment comes, boom, then you're ready with your policy and you're ready with your innovation. And But but these kinds of partnerships, when Roma hit, they were able to pass the Domestic Worker Bill of Rights in seven different states within like just a couple months of that movie getting visibility. And so I think there are these moments even without the financial incentive where um, you see powerful effects, you know, in the United States also, another example would be uh, gay marriage, right? Like for a very long time, there was no support for gay marriage in the United States. Like it looked like it was never gonna happen, but all, if you ask advocates and then the Supreme Court just made it legal and then that was it. I mean, really it's just like, boom, 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 boom. Now, of course that's always got the potential to backslide. But when you when advocates talk about what happened there, yes, there was agitation. Yes, there was orchestration and innovation. But a lot of them point to all these TV shows that were happening for like a decade before about, you know, I don't know if you know these TV shows, but Will and Grace was a show about a gay guy and his straight, his straight female roommate. And it was just a normal show about them in their apartment and all the funny things that were happening to them. And it just very slowly normalized what it is to be gay in America. And then when it was time, boom, it happened like fast. So I think there, I think the media has a role to play and it doesn't always have to be a popular, you know, super big money maker to uh, make a difference. But I hear your point. I mean, it, it would be nice if, you know, the starving artist could get more visibility, but yeah. Hi, I'm Carlos, a PhD student from University of Politecnico de Madrid. Okay, cool. I want to ask because uh, regarding to innovation, uh, the 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 team when you are make you want you want to innovate, the team is the most 
is one of the most important parts of 100%. the innovation of uh, do you how do you manage to connect people for making that innovation for example one person has the idea, have the idea but doesn't have the the scenario the know the yeah. knowledge of the scenario how do you manage to connect that people yeah. for making innovation we don't do it for them but we do encourage that they do it and that they do it very carefully so what i observe is that they oftentimes um you know, go to other universities or places where they're going to find people with those specialties. But we definitely encourage being very careful about that. And this is where the values work, I think, is very important. I think it's very easy when you're desperate to find someone who has the technical skills that you don't have to just find somebody who's very good. And we've seen, Ali can tell you about it too, many mistakes where someone looks just for the technical, they don't look for the commitment to the problem. And then because halfway through, they realize their innovation is not going to work, like the specific way that they thought they would make the change, it's not working. And then they want the leader wants to pivot because they care about the problem. They don't care about the solution. They care about the problem. And then the rest of the team is like, no, that's not, that's not what we do. We came here to build a product. You know what I mean? And they don't want to come along for the ride because they don't care about the problem. So I'm not helping you, but I would say just make sure when you're filtering for that, this is the biggest piece of advice is like, they have to fall in love with the problem, not the solution. And that's, that's what I would say. Um, has to find in the other way, the sample that people have, has the knowledge there for making innovation. And you want to join? And you do you, and he wants to find someone that knows about the environment, about the problem, about the situation, the place where you want to innovate. Yeah. I mean, I think it's the same thing, just like making sure there's values alignment, you know, but there, there are all sorts of, yeah. There, there is also cases that in the other way, not someone that knows that wants to change something, but doesn't have the technology in the other way. You're saying like, I have skills and I want to apply them to some yeah, social I don't problem. know the, the environment that, for example, you want to change something in right. Africa, but you don't have all the knowledge for doing make, for right. making that part in Africa. So what I'm saying is like, first, I would do that inner work to look at why you want to work in Africa. You know what I mean? Like yes. trying to find your personal story. I know that sometimes you're just like, I'm happy to help anywhere. But what I find is the truth is at the end of the day, you're not actually happy to help anywhere, you know? So figuring out how to communicate your values of like why you're pursuing this, even if it's not, I know about the food system, but it's like, this is my cause. Like, this is my, this is what's motivating me. I think that's going to get you a job faster than just like, I have skills. I'll do anything. But that's just my, my suggestion. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi, thank you. My name is Naila. I work here at ITZ. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, legitimacy and privilege because yes. <laughs> sometimes you feel legitimate to work in something, yes. let's say in your home country, but then you move and you don't always feel yeah. legitimate to work on a problem in a house that is not yours. Yep. Uh, it's my case. Yeah. <laughs> I come from Lebanon. There's a lot of problems in Lebanon, but I don't feel like I have the structure to work there. Uh, so I come to work here and I feel like I learn a lot, but hopefully like some structures will appear there so I can contribute, but I cannot right now. Yeah. So what's the, well, how do you solve the legitimacy issue of <laughs> not working in your house? I think being in a place and, you know, finding ways to commit, it's a very important question. First of all, I think just being aware of that and saying like, I'm not from here. You know, I, I, I myself have done that. Like I, I, went, I, um, before I was at Harvard, I worked in new Orleans. I'm from New York city originally. Uh, Hurricane Katrina came, it decimated the entire city. It closed the one free hospital that was serving 40% of the city indefinitely. So for years, there was no free hospital for that. I happened to be doing work in, in mental health and like in the face of trauma in Los Angeles, not in New Orleans. A friend of mine is from New Orleans and he said, can you come and do some of the programs here that you've been doing with the children there? Because he runs a school and he's from there and he's like, nobody's here, like we're desperate. So in the beginning, okay, like he's my connection, but then um, some other people asked me to do, and I find myself now in a community that I don't understand at all. And it's a very risky thing to do, talk about unintended consequences, because I don't know what I don't know. Um, so I think you begin by just being very open about that, right? Like I asked 
the people that I was working with, like, look, I'm not from here. You're going to have to help me with this. And uh, they said, okay. And then at one point I had a very meaningful conversation with a priest there who, uh, cause everything is, or a pastor, because a lot of it is faith-based institutions in the South and the United States. And he said, are you going to sweat here? Are you going to move here? Are you going to pay taxes here? And I said, okay, like I'll come. And he said, then you can do the work here. And are you going to leave in six months or are you going to be here for a while? You know? And so I stayed for four years. I put in a lot of time. Four years is still only a small amount of time, but like, I think just having these open conversations about where your legitimacy is, is important. And we still also, communities like New Orleans are so insular. Nobody ever goes, like people go for vacation, but there's not, there's a lot of strong bonding social capital, but not a lot of bridging social capital. And so what I also realized is I have a very unique role to play. I'm going to bring the resources from outside that would never otherwise care about New Orleans. And I'm going to be the one that brings that. So I'm bringing something to the table. I'm not only taking, like I'm bringing something that they need, that they value, money, resources. I brought, I mean, my best friend still lives in New Orleans today because I said, leave what you're doing and come here and like help in the legal system. So I think it's just really unpacking what value is needed and what, what value you really can bring. Um, and that was, that's what I would say. That's how you build legitimacy. You create value, not by your terms, but by their terms. While other people think on additional questions, I have one. Because you were talking before about the scale, right? And when we talk about social change, we need to think at scale, right? Yes. Because otherwise, and, and of course it's hard with, uh, I mean, it's very even, hard. even being at Harvard, you know. No, we don't know. <laughs> but having a, a group of six people and and numbers that you mentioned. So, how are you thinking in bringing this change at scale? Are you thinking in transforming systems in any way? And are you partnering with other social innovation centers across the globe? So, tell us more about your thoughts on yeah, how to like scale our this up. Theory of change at SICE. Yes, and yeah. how you can make this happen and how, how can you collaborate us. with others to to yeah i mean first of all um again like we're young and so for me it's important to just build out our own like get our own house in order as you say before we're going out and partnering with people because yes the harvard brand is good but i'd like to be offered more than that you know like i, I so we've spent a lot of time thinking about what frameworks do we think are useful testing out our own educational offerings, making sure that they're very well received, that they're adding value for people, that people are benefiting, that we work with and finding them to be helpful. So we spent the upfront time doing that and also thinking about how to incorporate research into what it is that we teach. So first, like kind of finding our own model a little bit and understanding our own theory of change about what's helpful. Um, and now we are kind of entering into this other phase where we're saying, what can the how can we leverage the Harvard platform um, to maximize impact? And uh, I talked a little bit about kind of stakeholder convenings as one mechanism, I think, where we can be very um, thoughtful and intentional about like who we bring into a community and make sure that their very values aligned, that we're not bringing in people who say one thing but actually, you know, don't really care. So one thing is just, finding people who we trust. I mean, like really trusted relationships who we think are trying to break through and do something different that has that is deeply embedded in social and environmental progress. Um, so the partnerships there aren't even there as much as just like identifying who who cares and, and then looking and seeing sense making, like, what do you think we can do? I mean, a lot of it, like I'm here to ask, like what should Harvard University do how I recognize that we often can be a validator of things, right? So how can we use our brand to validate something that somebody else is doing? Like, why should we be the ones doing, you know, as much as just like offering support? So that's something that I'm thinking a lot about. I'm also thinking a lot about the financing side of social change. I think um, it's it's what we, we're very good at working with the grassroots people who are just like trying so hard we don't know very much yet about, you know, the people with financial resources and sort of how they're entering into the space. But I think because of our positioning, working with them more 
and actually having them think of themselves as innovators instead of being outside of the system, looking in, like pushing them to say, hey, you you have money and you're not just funding a social innovator. You need to be a social innovator. Like you need to rethink how financing works and not replicate the system is part of a new strategy that's emerging. We just brought on a new faculty member, David Wood, who started the Initiative for Responsible Investing. You remember, I don't know if you know him. He's now at SICE. And so he's really leading a lot of the work, um, but it's really like an organizing, it's almost like taking an organizer strategy, but on the financing side, which is an interesting combination because it's a very, usually that's a very top-down system. Um, what else? I think internally, we're also doing a lot to organize across the different schools at Harvard. So I'm sure the university is very, here has silos just like, <laughs> We have it too, right? So the business school people don't talk to the Kennedy school people and they don't talk to the design school people and they don't talk to the education people. Like, why would we talk to those people? Um, and yet we're all working on the same, many of the same social issues. So um, this is maybe boring to hear about, but it's very important internally. We've been organizing a coalition of faculty to basically like rally to the president to do to embrace this idea of doing more having more social responsibility as an academic institution so that's the beginning of something but it makes me i recognize that people look to harvard and honestly maybe we don't even always deserve that but they look to it as an example so i try to think about what can we do like if we do it then maybe it has ripple effects but then also like how can we shine a light on other people so those are the two yeah Thank you. I think I'll be a second. Thank you very much. <clears throat> sorry. I have a sore throat. Oh, doctor. I'm sorry. It's I can give you some of my water if you no, want. No, thank okay. you very much. I think I recovered. Well, my, um, I'm Juan, and I would like to ask something. Uh, I think it has to do with the scale. I yeah. see large scale problems here, I mean, for social change, it have to do a lot with power structure and studying that and values and all this, okay? And I, but precisely the example you set in your presentation was, uh, I think, rather a, a, small. a, a small scale. Yes, yes. And in the end, it can really be a large impact, okay? Right. Can, can produce a large True. impact, but on the other side. So do you have kind of, because I see it's closer to engineering innovation do you have kind of roadmap to just to to uh somehow, somehow to foster uh, uh this kind of small initiatives uh to make them larger yeah, just to them yeah, large just to 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 make it successful in the beginning because then they can grow up but the, the, i see the difficult thing just to make them successful in the beginning making something really makes oh, you think works that's, yeah and and something that works and and then uh I think you're asking, are we good at helping start something? Yeah. Yeah, I think that we are pretty good at that, actually. Yeah, that's. I, I think that the bigger challenge is hmm. the bigger scale stuff. Yeah, I think um, I'm happy to share the curriculum that we use in our accelerator, um, but it, was, it follows that 3P model. Um, and I think it's in combination, again, with, you know, you have to assume a basic level of functioning, like, hmm. does the person know how to run a team like you know we're we're presuming a lot of sort of basic i know how to run an organization type skills which that person needs to get somewhere and we don't address that but yes i think we we're good on sort of building a strategy that generates hmm. social value at the small scale what i think is actually harder is those transition points you just described so we have a case of a guy really interesting guy named sridhar tayur who created something called organ jet and um He's an interesting case because I find that a lot of social innovators have to follow this track where they have to generate value in a small scale first to gain legitimacy into the system. But then once they're in, the, mm -hmm. the solution that they began with is not the solution that you're going to scale. It's almost like you create something, as I was saying to whoever it was, just to get um, an entry point into the system, into the community and create the coalition that you need. And then from there, it's sense making to go to the next phase of what the system needs. So in his case, he um, we recognize in the United States, you can't if you if you need organ transfer, right? Like if you need a new new liver, um, you can't the organ cannot cross state lines very easily. So you have a lot of people waiting on a list for an organ, and then you have some people who they die and their organs are available, but only for a small period of time. 
and there's nobody in that community that needs exactly that organ and it gets wasted because it can't cross state lines. So he was an engineering professor and he actually wanted to reverse it. So he started flying people to the organs instead of the organs coming to the people. Okay. So he set up this whole model of flying people who need an organ transplant across state lines to get these organs. He did this for a long time. He saved a lot of people's lives. But at the end of the day, what he realized, of course, is that it's actually the supply. Like there's just not enough organs for all the people who need organ transplant. And um, he ultimately, after gaining a ton of legitimacy, saving a lot of lives in the field by leveraging what he is good at, he's an engineer, so he knew how to think about these flights and how to operationalize this at scale. He started encouraging families of people who lost you know, their children and did or to make a video saying, I really encourage you in this very sensitive moment, like your son just died in a car crash and now I'm, I am asking you to donate his body for other people. Like we did it and we are asking you, it's a very sensitive thing. It's not for religious reasons, for cultural reasons. It's a very difficult message. I mean, it's difficult no matter what, but for certain communities, especially they wouldn't do it. Now, in the beginning, this guy coming from an engineering school and making a video like this, nobody would accept that video. Nobody would show that video. He had to build legitimacy. He had to create value through this entrepreneurial initiative where he did have skills and then transition to this call for the supply of organs, which is much more powerful, much more impactful at the system, <laughs> um, but also much more sensitive. So I don't, I'm not exactly answering your question. I, I can talk as much as you'd like about how to get small things started. But I think the bigger point is actually how you start is not usually how you finish, which is why I think this, this um, problem person pathway framework is constantly happening in the background. It's dynamic. It's, you can be, you can be someone who has been able to feed a million children. I mean, we worked with a guy who fed a million children every single morning in India. He fed them breakfast. But now to get to the next 20 million children, he can't use his Six Sigma method anymore or whatever he uses. Like he needs to work with government. He needs to figure out a totally different set of actors. And this requires starting over from the beginning with his social impact strategy. So I wanted to share that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I'm over. <laughs> Thank you. Well, the, yes, last question. Thanks. Uh, I want to ask you, uh, uh, you could you uh, recommend one author or a book that we must read? Well, I think you should read Julie's book on power. <laughs> I mean, it depends on what you what you care about. I know, <laughs> Julie, this is for you. I'm advertising for you, Julie, uh, online. Um, no, but this is this is an incredible book. But tell me what your interest. Tell me something that you. What do you care about? Or like, tell me who are you? Uh, I'm a good science fellow. Uh, master. Yep. Um, I want to know if we have one book to read about the to comprehend that the moment we are living and to expand our horizons and uh, pull open our minds. That is a must to read. Yeah. Yeah. I. I mean, I understand. I was sort of interested in. Do you care about a specific problem or not? But I think if you're generally interested in just sort of deconstructing why things are the way they are. If you have an interest in this book, I think it is very helpful. It goes from understanding power as an individual, like who are you and what, how can you analyze your own, the power that's available to you, like Jesus, you, but then it also looks at the organizational level and also the, the, the system, the movement level. So it's very ambitious in that it tracks how power functions all the way through those units of analysis. But I think for that reason, it's also uh, very interesting and uh, applicable to a lot of people here. So I recommend it. I might have one extra copy if you want it. So I mean, I can look. <laughs> well, thank you so, so much, Brittany. It's yep. hard to summarize what <laughs> you don't we were to... discussing, but I would say first there, there is this always this tension between having impact at the local level so you can transform lives but also having impact at scale. Yes. And we're always talking, if you save one life, that life make a lot of sense. And it does, it does. And only one life, yeah. but you want to save millions of lives. So how can you balance both things? And we were, we had a great discussion about this. I also like very much this uh, idea of power and values and how are they connected and seeing power not as a dirty thing, yeah. but as something that it's needed yeah. to change, to change things, to make these transformations. And also uh, 
let's say authoritarian power and informal power so yes. formal and informal power and and how important it is to to manage both and finally maybe this your framework of problem uh, person or people pathway. and pathways and i like this idea of focusing a lot on the problem always not on the solution because yes. we get very attached to our own ideas and to our solutions and we have to always think about the problems and be agile and and even change or move towards solving the problem and and not attaching to a specific solution so thank you and i mean that's a kind of a humble <laughs> summary of the many things you mentioned so thank you so so much thank for you. for your insights for the nice dialogue for your comments and your reflections and and we are here we are happy to collaborate with you we are thank happy you. to to work on I mean, together on, on solving and tackling these challenges you mentioned at the beginning because we, we are in a, in a crisis, multi-dimensional crisis, and we have, we have to. to work together. Yes, we do. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And there is coffee and hopefully some drinks, not alcoholic, but <laughs> <laughs> you drinks also. <laughs>